Hi, everyone. If you're just joining us, I am Priya Agarwal. I'm a machine learning engineer at Snorkel AI, and you are in the techniques track. This event is organized into three tracks filled with some incredible talks, the data track, the techniques track, and the applications track. And you are currently in the techniques track. To join sessions in other tracks, navigate to agenda right above the stage and select the track you wish to join and enter the session. Or you could also view agenda in a grid view. Uh, to do that, you can go to chat and then docs or visit the Snorkel virtual booth. Um, so throughout the day, we will be running a few polls about your experiences with data-centric AI. And we will share the results at the end of the day uh, in the Snorkel AI virtual booth. To participate in the poll, navigate to the upper right corner of your screen and click the poll button. This poll will remain open during the talk. Please be sure to vote and provide your valuable inputs as member of the community. Awesome. Uh, with that, up next is a panel titled Strategies and Best Practices for Explainable AI. Please join me in welcoming panel moderator, VP Research at Eckerson Group, Kevin Petrie. Hi, Priyal. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Kevin? Good. Sorry for the pause there. Very no pleased worries at all. opportunity to, to join you. No, no worries at all. We're all really excited for your talk. And I'll give you the stage to introduce your panelists and take it away. Very good. Um, that's great. So I actually don't see my other panelists yet, but I assume they're joining here. Um, good. So I'll introduce myself quickly. I'm a VP of research here at Eckerson Group. We're a boutique research and consulting firm focused on data analytics. I run the research division. We build thought leadership content, best practices, material, product guides, and so forth to help data leaders figure out how to extract business value from data. Really pleased to have the opportunity to, uh, to lead this discussion with Ayman and Swati, and I will let them introduce themselves. Ayman, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Swati. Uh, so I am uh, Imangrida Abnaya. I am from Orange Innovation Division in France, um, and I am uh, tech leading the e transfers program named the AI Empowered Networks. So basically, we are building the next, uh, let's say, future network, a smarter network with uh, machine learning, cloud, and automation. Uh, we are, for example, heavily involved in the predictive network maintenance for mobile network, for fixed network, and for different other segments, and uh, building the data-driven uh, operation for the network and having better experiences for our customers, etc. Fantastic. And Swati, how about you? Hi, everyone. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Ivan, and everyone who's uh, called in to listen to our panel. I am uh, coming from the academic side, so I'm a faculty at Georgia Tech, and I'm a Faust Family Early Career Professor there in the School of Industrial Systems Engineering. I'm also affiliated with the Machine Learning Center, and I serve as the lead of Ethical AI in a recently awarded NSF AI Institute, uh, AI for Optimization, since uh, 2021, since last year. I have a PhD in operations research from MIT, and my research interests are in optimization, machine learning, and specifically algorithmic fairness. So I'm very excited about this panel. And uh, my work cuts across many domains, such as e-commerce, quantum optimization, energy, and uh, we are partially supported by NSF and DARPA. So I'm excited to talk to you all about auditable, explainable AI. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So thank you both. So to, to kick things off, I'm, I'm excited about this topic for a few reasons. One is that it's of high interest to so many of the enterprises and mid-sized enterprises that um, the data leaders and the business leaders that are trying to figure out how to capture new value from data using artificial intelligence and especially machine learning. Um, so it's a hot topic. Generally, for research purposes, we look to define what something is, why organizations might need it, and how they should go about it. And I think what's fun about this topic is that I believe most organizations and most experts believe explainable AI is a good thing. We need it because we need to demonstrate to executives, to auditors, to regulatory authorities, exactly what the inputs are for various recommendations coming out of, for example, machine learning models. This helps a lot of different stakeholders ensure that they're not raising risk 
and actually undermining value rather than creating new business value. So the why of this topic is, is pretty interesting. The what it is beyond the high level definition of that's provided, I think it's tricky. And the how, the how you achieve it gets really tricky. So that's why we're going to talk about strategies, how, and best practices to dig into that. So why don't I start by uh, going to you, Swati, and, and asking, how do you define explainable AI? How does it relate to some of the other concepts such as auditable AI, such as model governance, AI governance? Uh, thanks, Kevin. So I, I think explainability of any process, of any uh, methodology, uh, AI explainability cannot be defined unless we ask explainably to whom. And in that sense, then it starts connecting to auditability, ethics, and governance. So for instance, suppose we were auditing an AI system, we might want to explain different trends in underlying data, different labels that we see in data, different uh, uh, model decisions for different spaces of instances, of uh, types of data that we see, explain deviations from suspected behavior. And all of these uh, explanations for the AI system would fall into an audit for that system. When we think of ethics, we want to maybe explain and audit AI outcomes and the process itself. So maybe we want to ask, why are we framing this question? Why are we using this uh, uh, AI to answer a particular question? Like, is it even the right thing to consider? Like, for example, do we want to uh, build an AI system that uh, predicts whether somebody that labels somebody as a potential criminal or not just based on their image? Do we want to do that? Is that even an ethical question? And so that that would be the connection to audit, uh, to ethics. Uh, the way we audit these uh, ethical questions, explain these ethical questions can be varying. Uh, we could have a, a process-oriented audit, uh, an explanation which can check if different populations were treated similarly in, in a pipeline for an AI system or a data-oriented audit can check if data was modified strategically. Then how does metadata or outcomes change. And those are sort of guided by the ethics aspect. Uh, the link to governance for explainability relies on understanding you know, invariants or properties of your system that you can explain outside of that AI system. You can say that, you know, if I have a steering wheel in an in an autonomous uh, uh, vehicle, then if I turn it right, it actually goes right, right? So that, that sort of starts connecting to governance at a very uh, sort of abstract level, right? So one can ask, you know, are um, incentives for various stakeholders in my uh, uh, process actually aligned in the AI system? And, and what are, you know, am I meeting maybe the legal and policy requirements? If I'm operating in uh, sensitive domains, then those kind of explainability uh, then starts linking to governance. Um, as an example, to make all of these ideas a little bit concrete and to, un to sort of chalk out the differences between these uh, various explainable ways, uh, we are, uh, you know, we've been working on developing a system for screening applicants for a job. Now, employment is a sensitive domain. It's protected by anti-discrimination laws. And we've been working together with an interdisciplinary team that uh, consists of uh, a law and ethics professor, uh, Professor Devin Desai at uh, Scheller School of Business at Georgia Tech, and uh, uh, my team of graduate students, which, which are led by Jad Selim, who's a fifth year uh, graduate student now. And uh, so when I think about explaining what is happening in a screening system, an audit might consist of understanding why different decisions were taken for pairs of resumes which had slight differences in irrelevant attributes. I only care about, care about qualification of candidates. I might want to understand the social context of the problem that sort of starts linking to the ethics aspect of it. What is a social concept? Can we explain trends across qualified candidates with a four-year traditional degree versus a non-traditional degree, but they're still qualified? Uh, from a governance perspective, we might want to ensure that qualified STEM minorities are not systematically screened out. And so now we are really looking at impacts and how it sort of relates to the anti-discrimination laws. But even in the process itself, how do we mod how do we use protected attributes in that pipeline? So you see, like all of these are explanations of that AI system, but they are guided, motivated, and they're answering different aspects of explainability. So Swati, I, I love the notion of uh, driver with the hands on the wheel of the autonomous car, because <laughs> they need to see very clearly what's on the road 
what are the things that the model might be missing? They might never have seen a zebra run across the road or something mm -hmm. like that, but sometimes these things happen. Zebra is a bad example, but you, you right. need to you need to have the oversight, you need the visibility to maintain it. So human in the loop interactions become very important too. Yes, um, exactly. And yeah, I'm just going to say real examples, right? Like deviations from mm -hmm. invariance, invariant behavior. Like what is expected behavior? Uh -huh. When am I deviating? Can I explain why I'm deviating from that ex expected behavior? And and so sort of it's it's answering, it's serving different pro different um goals in in that right like to to a person who's buying the car i want to say yes if you turn left it's going to go left the person doesn't care about uh you know uh, maybe how what the process in actually developing that car was right but yeah. if i want to audit it internally inside my organization i want to unpack that process and understand what are the sensitive spaces? Where are the error rates higher? Can I can I understand what are the strategic? Uh, uh, if I change strategically, how do the behaviors change? How can I actually right? Like so, I want to then dig into unwrap it a little bit more. It really depends on whose explanation directly. To it. Yeah, definitely agree. So, Ivan, tell me um, the the definition that we have on the table here for AI explainability and how it relates to some other important concepts like ethics, bias, and so forth. What, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that yeah. your First, experience with AI is maybe a little more operationally yeah. focused. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what Swati was, what we're saying. So it's, it's all about the human and the AI system that we are all building from different, you know, different uh, subject matter expertise. So to, to, to say it simply, explainability, it's how to explain uh, what the model is doing or the model behavior in human terms. It's how to explain this to the subject matter expert, how to explain this to the business owner that is going to use and uh, use this, this AI system. So today, uh, I mean, it's not research only. There is also tools that are embedded in the public cloud that we can use and, you know, in the operationalization of the AI. We are, for example, using in GCP, the Google Cloud Platform, the AI explainable uh, features. In the Amazon, you can also talk about about Sage Micro Clarify and many other libraries that exist also in open source. So explainability is also coming with tools. And all those tools are how to um, enable building the meaning of what the model is outputting to us in terms of insights, in terms of prediction, in terms of prediction, how we can explain uh, what the model is outputting vs what we injected into the model in terms of data. So the idea is to explain this journey of data we're injecting, what the model is telling us, and be able to explain it to humans. Because, for example, on the telco world, when you say, hey, there is an anomaly here, so how to explain this is an anomaly to the network operational teams. You have to tell them, yes, this is related to potentially an incident that will happen. So if it is an early detection for them, even the data, they cannot understand it. So we need to, to bridge the gap between what is detected, what you are injected, and how we can explain this to the to the to the to the subject matter expert and in the network domain from, from my perspective. And today we can look at it from from Two perspectives, this is what the state of the art at least is mentioning. Globally, we can look to the feature matrix, the global feature mat features that we are selecting and how those are contributing to the model results. So it's global, let's say, analysis of the ensemble of features we, we, we worked on. Or you can also look at it locally, each feature, how this feature is contributing to those to this model result. And this will lead me to a uh, link to the ethics, for example, if you want to detect bias, then the local, let's say, uh, analysis of the features will lead us to see if this feature is introducing bias into our models or not. <clears throat> With respect to the governance, I relate this to the MLOps approach itself. So the explainable AI, <coughs> sorry for my voice, should be part of the pipeline. So it's not only about detecting the drift or detecting the model is distorted, it's also to put a component that is enabling us the explainability as a must have, as a part of the pipeline, so that we can, let's say, analyze and use this tool while having this, let's say, field, I would say, percentage of transparency. And here I would like to touch base on the interpretability, which is today a controversial topic. Okay, explainability vs interpretability. And I would say I have to say two words. So for the interpretability, uh, it's a question of how much I need transparency of my 
um, I mean, in my machine learning journey. Do I need to understand every and each feature and weights in the model? Here we are more on interpretability level. If I need only to explain the model behavior and relate the input to the output and master, you know, the ethics, the bias, etc. So maybe the explainability is only what I need. So it's kind of two level of, of between high transparency and uh, explainability, but it's not a choice, actually. It depends on the model we are using and the machine learning behind this. So if you are going for interpretability, then I would say basic model like decision tree, et cetera, will make it. So here you master everything. When the more you go to neural network, then we can only talk about explainability. We don't have a choice. It's a matter how all the techniques that we can use to, 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 to explain that. So yeah, it, it, I tend to agree with Swati, and I added this, this part of how we can operationalize this today. And, and this is what we are doing also in Orange in our pipelines for the network part and others too. So great stuff. And I mean, I like your point about the, the, the notion of the ML ops and the machine learning life cycle. We've done a lot of research that on that at Eckerson Group and the, the, the three phases, data and feature engineering, then model development and training, the third phase uh, production, which is gonna include a lot of monitoring, a lot of governance, uh, including observability, including explainability, and it's going to have to loop because you have to iterate in exactly. order to improve. So, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you have to loop to make sure that you have the accountability, that you can trust this pipeline, that you can leverage, that you can make people more responsible on what they choose. So yes, this looping is very important and the explainability will help on having, you know, what are the factors that we need to change? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, I'm going to, in the interest of time, combine our second and our third question, which is, why is this hard to do? How do you overcome obstacles? Uh, and so, Swati, why don't, why don't we start with you? Uh, it's a big question. It's going to vary quite a bit by use case, enterprise, industry, and so forth. But we'd love your high-level thoughts from your academic perspective. So uh, I, I think Ayman already started getting into a little bit of that, right? Like with the cyclic uh, development, and I think that's that's very important. I would say it's, it's hard to achieve because it's an active area of, uh, it's, an, it's hard to achieve in the sense that, you know, there, there are many moving parts when you develop an AI process. And um, it's an active area of research with many challenging problems. The first of all, the first problem is, you know, computers see the society through the lens that we develop for them. And so they see what the societal process is because of, how we model the data, the proxies we use, uh, what are the variables, what are the constraints, what are the objectives, let's say, you know, uh, what what are we trying to achieve from an AI system? Like it's it's really dependent on how we encode all that. And, and that's, I think, a, the first step towards explaining uh, any uh, AI or a machine learning system, you know, what what are the axioms or what are the uh, primitives that you're assuming here? And uh, for data itself, you know, ground labels might be missing, uh, for example. And so we need to understand if if the data was created for the application that we intend to use it, if transfer learning is even possible in a particular domain that we're working on. And, um, and, and sort of dig into, you know, where the data is coming from. Are we actually missing big uh, spaces in the data? You know, uh, are we missing uh, a big, uh, what do you call it, like um, interaction or uh, participation through different demographics just because of the way the application is set up? Uh, in an AI system, of course, then one has to worry about the metadata that one creates. And this metadata, as Ayman also pointed out, could be interpretable features or they could be completely uh, something that's... Um, uh, hard to interpret or explain, but maybe easier to make transparent. And how? Uh, and and so that's I think a huge uh, part of the challenge. How do you actually interpret metadata, or how do you actually uh, uh, see that you know these changes in the metadata because of the changes in the data would actually propagate to the decisions and try to explain that process. So that's unpacking how the AI is working and why is it working that way. Uh, the other challenge is the inherent randomness in an AI model and how do we sort of account for that even for uh, the same person, let's say in an e-commerce website might come and uh, look at the price of an item, but because we have our learning algorithms in, the prices shown might vary over time and, and so the behaviors are different. And so how do we account for the inherent randomness in our processes? Um, a, a lot of applications of AI, like be it voice or uh, uh, you know, image recognition, whatever. So a lot of applications are uh, operate with a highly nonlinear decision space and approximate models that people have developed academically or even even in in uh, in uh, uh, 
many applied scenarios. Uh, they approximate the model, like for instance, using a decision tree, which can help do a bigger sanity check, right? But often the, the adversarial examples or the examples uh, which are uh, contentious outliers in the system come from that non-linearity, which we've not been able to capture because of these course approximations. And, and that's, that's a big challenge. But I think even before we get to that, uh, uh, sort of big research question. I think there's a lot that organizations can already do to make that uh, AI uh, process more explainable. Uh, absolutely. So, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. <clears throat> the first thought that comes to my mind is related to the MLOps that we were touching with just before. I yeah. mean, we're trying with a machine learning uh, pipeline to have good performance and to do, uh, you know, near real-time detection and to have, you know, a kind of fast analysis that we can bring into the top while using machine learning. So um, how we can balance between these requirements of you know, fast analysis, near time detection, and adding the component of the explainability, because this may also require some time of analysis and sometimes of, you know, validating those results or, you know, looping to that. So the, the first point is on technical one, it's about the performance, how we can manage the performance of the end-to-end -end pipeline. The second one, as Swati is, is, was saying, it's also about the models that we are we are selecting and using. Sometimes even, and, and we had this example in the network domain, so we've used, for example, Shapely for the explainability. So we had uh, the top 10, you know, explainable uh, uh, anomalies to the network teams, but as those were some of them early detection, they didn't understand why the model is pointing this anomaly and this sequence of data. So it's not because we can do it, then it means the subject matter expert will all the time be understanding the meaning of that. So sometimes it's it's complex. It's complex from, from, from a network perspective, from a domain perspective in general. And so, yeah, in addition to the performance and, and, and the tooling and how to interpret that, I think it's also a matter of trust. We need, we need to be able to, you know, to have measurable, uh, let's say, indicator to say yes now, we are. Uh, we have a good indicator that we are uh, in a good level of explainability, acceptable, and this can go into production. So, how to measure that? Because today, for me, it's kind of subjective. Yes, we get the top the top ten factors. We agree on that, but maybe we're missing some factors. How to make sure that we are not missing anything? So, it's a matter of of trust of all the pipeline with measurable indicators that, to my opinion, we don't have them yet today. That's great. And I mean, you might have seen that we had, did have a question about using shapes. So I'm glad you addressed that in terms of how you're using it to explain network data anomalies. Swati, go ahead. I was saying that uh, uh, I guess one important part, like even before we get into uh, actual techniques for explaining different uh, parts of the uh, ML ops, is, is really to start having the culture of interdisciplinary teams who can talk to each other and, and come at the uh, uh, AI process from a very different perspective. You know, is the framing of the question correct? Are we who are we targeting? What is the data intended for? Uh, things like that that can actually cross talk because one of the big challenges um, has been like if, if a person is trained in law and privacy policies, how do they even interact with ML teams to understand whether something is auditable or not, and and whether whether something meets the requirements um, that you know your company might uh, organization might want to enforce, right? And and so creating that common language is one of uh, one thing that I should have mentioned, which I forgot. So. Um, great stuff. You know, I, I might add um, that. Uh, Communication is, is tricky too, and in different training levels, um, you, you've articulated both of you very well some of the technical issues with understanding explainability, but then boiling that up to a level that intelligent business people are going to understand is definitely tricky, and finding the right way to do that. Um, um, or, early in the process, because one of the things that we found with our research is they really want to have closely prog cycle. They can only do it if they can understand in a very um, clear business owner's way. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What's the logic to get there? Mm -hmm. um, so great stuff. So I, I do want to encourage folks to ask questions as we go here. Um, we, we love the discussion, and I would love to hear that. It might be that I've hit the wrong button here. I apologize if so, because I'm not able to pull up 
a chat window at this moment. It was there and it vanished, but perhaps Ayman or Swati, you could let me know if we do have questions coming in. And if not, I'll put someone to you. Yeah, there is a question on the techniques uh, like SHAP. I can confirm, yes, it was useful in, in the case that we, uh, that we, where we tested it uh, on the network data, uh, because uh, the top, let's say, uh, the top five uh, um, uh, anomalies that were pointed by SHAP were confirmed, confirmed by the network teams as, yes, important, uh, let's say, incidents that are going to happen. But I would say that the other part was for them not clearly uh, understandable why those were pointed as, uh, as let's say, there is a link between those anomalies and the input data. So for the early detection, it's impossible for them to tell because they didn't know what is going to happen. But for some other, uh, let's say, top five anomalies, it was for them very useful because this will will even help them to find the root cause uh, that is that is going to happen in the network or that is happening in the network. So yes, I confirm that this is useful. Uh, and it's actually sharp. It's also embedded in many of the public cloud today, as I said, at GCP and, and SageMaker. I've seen that this is already in their managed services. Very good. Um, thank you, I mean that's fantastic. Swati, I'd like to get your take on um, the regulatory landscape as it pertains to model explainability. Um, I think that there has been legislative focus very much in the U.S. and in EMEA on, um, on handling of personal, personally identifiable information. Yes. And so there's, there's sort of a growing level of public scrutiny about what's happening um, with, with their data. And my expectation is that model explainability will start to become more of a regulatory requirement. But I'd love to get your perspective and then I'm in as well from a, from a European perspective. I think that's just, uh, actually like when I started working in this area, uh, GDPR had just come out in Europe, and yeah, that's okay. a huge problem, right? Like because the 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 laws seem to imply that you know you should be able to explain critical decisions and critical domains to people for data subjects, and people didn't know how to make those explanations. And so I think we. Like, I think going forward, this becomes a, a very important issue. Like in California, for instance, there's a con consumer privacy uh, CCPA, Consumer California Consumer Protection Act, which says that, you know, if, if you're sort of, uh, you should not be treating people differently based on the amount of personal information that you have. But everybody knows that personalized pricing actually does help retailers uh, earn, earn, increase their profits, right? And so so we are, we are sort of getting into the space where, um, incentives of different organizations may not be completely aligned with the governance. And this is where we need to be very careful and, and develop methods for explaining for governance. Yeah, very much. I, I, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it, it, it's same, you know, for, for Europe, for example, for any automated decision making, actually with AI or not, we need to be able to explain the logic behind. So for automated system, which is, you know, usually rule based, etc. It's clear what are the rules there. But with AI explainability uh, and the measurable metrics become a must. And uh, in Orange, for example, we have a um, clear role now of AI responsible in, in innovation division and also in the different affiliates. So we have, uh, you know, uh, nominated people for that role of responsible AI. And the goal is to put in place the processes, define the, uh, you know, the metrics, define uh, during the problem framing of the machine learning project, you have the assessment of Yes, how much you need this to be explainable because you have an automated decision or a closed loop later on. So yes, we're trying to implement this, not only with definition, but also with processes and metrics in order to, to, to have it operationalized and compliant to the GDPR. Awesome, uh, that was a fascinating discussion with so many insights from both industry and academia. Uh, Very good. Really appreciate um, at least time. on my end, Oyman, you broke up slightly there at the end. I don't know if other folks are, are having trouble. Um, I was able to hear you clearly. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for all your time, um, Kevin, Iman, Swati. It was such a fascinating discussion, and I learned so much uh, about this like really crucial topic, essentially, of explaining your models. So, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation.
thanks priya uh, thanks kevin and thanks amen uh, there are also uh, there's some questions on the chat do you think we can uh, continue sort of discussing it there or so the speak the yeah, audience will be redirected in like 10 seconds so they will oh, want okay. to show you after okay, that okay feel free to reach out to us uh, yes, on our email and uh, our website information is on on the website so just feel free to yes. reach out for any of the questions speaker bios <laughs> we missed out thank yeah. you bye bye see you all okay thank you thank you